Hey guys, this video is sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is the streaming service with the best selection of horror thrillers and supernatural movie series and originals. Halloween's right around the corner, but why wait for it when you can start streaming now ad-free on all your favorite devices, including iOS, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and Google Chromecast. Shudder is unparalleled with their unique collection of exclusive and original films, horror classic and blockbuster hits, and you can experience it all for just $5.99 per month or $56.99 per year. Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Vicious Fun, The Mortuary Collection, and PG Psycho Gorman, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit creep TV show series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code IMR. I like literally just talked about it, but I recently watched the first season of the Shudder exclusive creep show series, and I really enjoyed it. It's fun, campy, and it's got scary moments too. So I would definitely recommend this if you're a fan of Goosebumps because it's kind of like Goosebumps for adults. Try Shudder for 30 day free trial. Go to Shudder.com and use promo code IMR. Link is in the description box below. My brother Eddie and I loved Halloween. We both had major sweet tooths, so our favorite thing to do on Halloween was trick-or-treating with our friends. On the last Halloween we ever had together, I went as Batman while he went as Superman. All our friends were dressed like superheroes to fit with the theme we had going on for us. There were five of us in total and we went down the same trick-or-treating route we'd used for the last few years. We met the same familiar faces who'd come to expect us and got compliments on our costumes on every house we knocked on. Once we finished with the route, we sat down at a public bench for a small snack break. We'd finished a little earlier than expected and the night was still young, so none of us felt like going home just yet. Are you guys down for trick-or-treating at a new street tonight? I don't see why not. Yeah, sure. Where do you wanna go? I overheard some of the other kids talk about a house with homemade sweets a few blocks down from here. It's that creepy house with the dead tree outside. You guys know it, right? I thought that house was abandoned. Apparently not. It sounded like the candy was really good by the way they talked about it. We all unanimously agreed that it couldn't hurt to visit the house. After all, we were going to be trick-or-treating out in the open in full view of every other trick-or-treater, so we thought it'd be safe enough. Eddie led our group ahead to the house he was talking about. Every kid in the neighborhood knew about the house. But up until then, I'd assumed that it was abandoned too. The lawn was overgrown and a single dead tree with the branches like gnarled grasping hands stood above the tall grass. There were no Halloween decorations, but the old house with its molded faded wood and crumbling tiled roof looked spooky enough without it. The closest thing to a decoration was a hollowed out pumpkin placed in front of the door with a note reading, Take only two. The dusty window beside the door was illuminated from the inside, outlining the silhouette of someone in a witch's hat rocking back and forth on a chair through closed curtains. Inside the hollowed pumpkin were roundish candies wrapped in cheap plastic with no brand. Each of us took two candies and went on our way trick-or-treating at every house on the street. Eddie and I arrived back home a little earlier than expected at around seven o'clock and opened the door with a hidden key under the flower pot. Our parents were out that night for work and wouldn't be home until midnight, so we had the place to ourselves in the meantime. In the spirit of the holiday, we both sat on the couch and watched some R-rated horror movies while gorging ourselves on our trick-or-treat candies. Halfway through the movie, Eddie unwrapped the candy from the witch's house. It turned out to be a bright orange piece of candy shaped like a jack-o'-lantern. He tossed it into his mouth and I saw his eyes go wide. Bro, no kidding. This is delicious. Is it? What flavor is it? I, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I heard a cracking sound, followed by greedy crunches as my brother chewed on the hard piece of candy. He always did that with hard candy, and I'd be disgusted by it every time. Right after he finished his first jack-o'-lantern candy, he put the other one he got from the house into his mouth before chewing and swallowing it just as quickly. I'm serious. This has got to be the best candy I've ever had. <laughs> if you say so. We should go get some more at that creepy house. 
Trick-or-treating time's almost over anyway, so it's not like we'd be taking away from a lot of people. What do you say? Nah, bro, I'm good. You go ahead. I'm happy with my Kit Kat bars. Suit yourself. I'll be back in like an hour. I eventually did end up trying the jack-o'-lantern candy while my brother was out to get more. It had to be the sweetest piece of candy I'd ever eaten, and I couldn't tell what flavor it was supposed to be either. I guessed that it might have been orange or pumpkin flavored, judging by the shape and color, but I couldn't be sure. I ended up eating both of them, but instead of chewing and swallowing like Eddie did, I just let them dissolve in my mouth. By the time I was finished with both of them, I was already satisfied with what I got. Eddie returned home at around 8 o'clock, right as everyone else was calling it a night. His trick-or-treat bag was topped up with the plastic-wrapped pumpkin candy, and he happily munched on them as we continued to watch horror movies on the TV. I didn't bother to ask if he'd share his special candy. I doubt he'd give them to me, and I was content with what I already got anyways. Eddie got sick later that night. Our parents assumed that he just had a bit too much candy that night. It wouldn't have been the first time. I thought the same too until he started vomiting right before bed. I helped him to the bathroom and rubbed his back as he emptied the contents of his stomach. I tried not to look at his vomit before I flushed it because, you know, gross. But something strange caught my eye as it was being flushed away. Scattered and floating in his sludgy yellow vomit were over a dozen of the jack-o'-lantern candies, still perfectly intact instead of dissolved or even cracked. The sinister black grins and half-closed eyes almost seemed to be mocking my brother as he puked more and more of them out for me to flush down the toilet. Eddie went to bed sicker than ever that night. We shared a bedroom, so I was able to hear every cough and uncomfortable groan he made as we both struggled to go to sleep. Eventually, I did manage to drift off into a dreamless sleep as my brother struggled to find a comfortable position in the bed beside me. I didn't know how long I slept, it might have been minutes or hours for all I knew. I was woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of muffled screaming in the bed beside me. My eyes flew open and I turned my head towards my brother's bed. Eddie, are you all right? My blood froze in my veins at what I saw. Standing over my brother, holding one wordy hand over his mouth, was an honest-to-God witch. She wore a long black robe that covered every part of her body save for her gnarled hands with yellow fingernails so long and sharp they looked like claws. Her skin was the color of green bile and covered in warts and boils that looked like they could pop at any moment. In one fluid motion, she dragged a long, sharp fingernail across my brother's stomach. When she did, hundreds of the orange jack-o'-lantern candies spilled out of him, and my brother went silent and still. She shoveled the candy into a black bag but stopped at the final two pieces of candy. She took the last two candies and looked at me dead in the eyes with shrunken black pupils. I couldn't move. I couldn't even scream because my brain still refused to process what I'd just seen. The witch placed the final two pieces of candy on my nightstand and uttered two words that would forever haunt me. Take only two. <laughs> This happened when I was eight years old. I was a hyperactive kid in my childhood. My parents spoiled me to such an extent that I also never hesitated to bully kids less than my age. In a few words, I wasn't a good kid back then. My mom never denied anything that I put my hands into, and my dad thought giving everything to a child is the key to raising them in the right way. How terribly wrong they were. I couldn't make many friends as all the kids in the neighborhood saw me as a menace. Even though their parents complained about my cruel behavior, my parents ignored them and went on saying, I am the best and other kids are just jealous of me. Let me tell you this, when a parent hides the fault of their kid and encourages them even though they are wrong, that kid can never grow up to be a good human being. My parents made me believe that I own this world and no matter how many wrongful deeds I do, they'll always be there to save my ass. It was prior to Halloween the entire town was getting decked up with Halloween decorations. As usual, being the rich, spoiled kid, my dad brought me props enough to cover a huge mansion. I was hanging a huge jack-o'-lantern on the porch 
when I saw a few neighboring kids gathering on the side of the road talking among themselves. What are you guys up to for tonight? I asked them. Nothing. Just planning which house to hit first for trick-or-treating. Hmm. Can I come with you guys? No. Leave us alone, you freak. Honestly, that was the first time I realized how everyone hates me except my parents. And trust me, it wasn't a good feeling at all. But I was only eight and I had no one who could tell me where I was going wrong. Because to my parents, I can never be wrong. I ran to my room, cried in the bathroom for some time, and then went into a full-on raging mode. I decided I will go trick-or-treating alone and I will collect the highest number of candy more than any other kid. As the night fell, every kid set out on their candy quest, dressing in various Halloween costumes. I lit up all the candles of my pumpkin heads with my dad and went to get ready for my personal adventure. I didn't tell them that the other kids have discarded me to avoid any interference from my parents in this matter. I dressed as Count Dracula. My dad bought me a nice cap with a red collar just like the Count wears. I took my bucket and went out on the road. Kids were in front of every house. I could hear them scream in joy. Trick or treat, let them be. I will collect on my own. I started walking up to the houses and asking for candy. Because of the notorious reputation that I created in this town, no house owner gave me more than two pieces of candy that were too small. One house owner even said, why are you asking for candy? Couldn't your dad buy a store? Get off my porch, you rich brat. Tears rolled down my eyes as I couldn't take that anymore. I ran away to hide my miserable self. I ran amidst the woods on that moonlit Halloween night. I didn't care where I was going. I never thought for once that at this hour, the woods aren't safe for an eight-year-old. After running for 10 minutes straight, I sat under a bushy tree and began to sob. I don't know how long I went like that. My concentration broke hearing two voices coming from a close distance. I got up and saw a small wooden house lurking at some distance. I could see shadows of a man and a woman on the other side of the window curtain as pale yellow light illuminated them arguing over something. I slowly walked to the house and read the name of the gate, Mr. and Mrs. Ginsburg. The reason I have never heard about them is that they live on the outskirts. I went to the main door and heard them arguing. I am never gonna leave you the key. You're a bloody junkie. You don't deserve my hard-earned money. Oh, really? You are living in my house? Don't forget that old hag. Saying this, Mr. Ginsburg slapped his wife and I heard her screaming while she fell on the floor. The fight got more intense and I was thinking of returning home when I peeked one last time from the porch window. The curtain on the window was tattered from one corner and I could see inside the house clearly from there. Just then, my eyes discovered a bowl full of candy lying on the dining table. I knew it would be easy for me to get candy from them as they won't recognize me. Being the adamant kid I was, I rang the doorbell and heard footsteps stomping on the floor. A rusty looking man opened the door and exhaled a cloud of smoke from his foul smelling cigar. What do you want? Um, trick or treat? There's no treat here. Get lost, you piglet. Saying this, the man slammed the door hard in my face. This is my only chance not to return home empty-handed, so I came up with a plan. I went to the other side of the house, searching for the back door. Luckily, there was a dog door adjacent to the back door. I knew they didn't have any dogs because, since I've come here, I haven't heard a single bark. I stood near the back door silently, waiting for one single chance. They were still in the living room, so I knew if I entered the house now, they would definitely catch me. Screaming and shouting, Miss Ginsburg stormed upstairs and her husband too followed. Finally, I thought. I crouched down and entered the house from the dog door. Their arguing voices could still be heard from upstairs. The house had a weird stench like something had died in there. I thought it better not to waste my time, so I slowly crawled under the dining table and sat there for a few seconds more. When I got absolutely sure that they were not coming downstairs soon, I grabbed the bowl from the table and poured all the candy into my bucket. It was filled with all kinds of sweetness. I even got a big chocolate bar. After emptying the entire bowl, I put it over the table carefully and was about to go back just like I came in when a terrifying scream took place followed by a loud gunshot. After that, everything got quiet. My heart skipped a beat. 
Oh my God. Before I could act on this matter, I heard footsteps rushing down the stairs. Out of options, I ran to the living room and rolled under the couch. I saw a pair of rusty brown boots going towards the kitchen sink and opening the tap in a hurry. There was no confusion in me that this man is none other than Mr. Ginsburg. I noticed his boots the first time I saw him. I could hear him washing his hands vigorously. He then walked to the main door and locked it. He did the same thing with the back door as well and then again went upstairs. Holy crap. Now I can't even walk out from the main door. If he heard me trying to unlock his door, I would be in great trouble. Being an eight-year-old, I tried to keep calm and think about how to get out of this situation. I thought to walk back to the back door again and sneak out from the dog door, but before I could come out, I heard a heavy sound. Something was being dragged down the stairs. Something heavy as I could hear Mr. Ginsburg's grunting noises like he was pulling down a huge load. There's no way I can walk to the back door now because the stairs face the back door. Lying down under the couch, I saw Mr. Ginsburg dragging down the body of a person. It was none other than his wife who was alive a few moments back. Dragging her blood-drenched body, Mr. Ginsburg placed it parallelly to the living room couch. Her wide, silent eyes kept staring at me as blood poured out from her open mouth. I was in complete panic. Even though I wanted to, I couldn't cry because that'll make me this madman's next target. The draining blood started to come in my direction and I slid away to avoid getting touched by it. But after a point, there was no space and the warm, thick blood turned my white sleeves red. It was the most horrific experience of my life. I then heard Mr. Ginsburg stop near the dining table for a moment. Suddenly, he turned around and said in a grumpy voice, Did you steal my candies, little piglet? Oh my God! He knows now. There's no way I am getting out of this situation alive. Come on out, little piglet. I won't hurt you. I have more candy for you. Come on out now. I knew very well that this man is lying and all he is going to give me is a painful death. He started ransacking the living room to find me. One by one, he was pulling and kicking all the furniture as he realized I was hiding somewhere. As soon as he came near the couch, I jumped out before he could grab me and kicked him in the nuts. He crouched down in pain and I ran towards the dog door, hovering in fear. I almost came out when he shot at me one more time, but luckily he missed. The bullet went through my high neck cape, saving my life. I didn't look back, didn't stop because I could hear footsteps chasing me in those dark woods. When I finally saw the lights of our town, I could hear my parents yelling my name. Seeing me gone for such a long time must have worried them. I saw my dad standing in the road and I ran to him and fainted in his arms. I woke up in my room surrounded by cops and my sobbing parents. They noticed the bullet hole in my cape and thought some maniac tried to kidnap me. But I told the cops everything I saw in that house. Obviously, Mr. Ginsburg realized I will spit out everything about the crime, so he escaped right away, leaving his dead wife in that house. The cops searched the house and along with the corpse of Miss Ginsburg, found a rotten dead body of a German shepherd in their bathroom tub. Mr. Ginsburg is still on the list of most wanted and I never went trick or treating after that. I also changed my behavior and became a quiet kid. I stopped going out much because the last time I entered the wrong house, I almost got killed. Hey guys. I see many of you commenting on my videos that this channel deserves 1 million subscribers. But I also see the percent of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So, if you like the content, want to support my channel, and want to see this channel reach 1 million subscribers, or maybe 500,000 subscribers, then go ahead, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. Every year on October 31st, I feel nothing but crippling fear. In truth, I'm not afraid of the supposed ghouls that roam the night. Neither am I afraid of the evil demons that come to take us in the scary tales we tell. There's nothing I fear more than the pitter-patter of little children's feet roaming the street asking for candy. And this gruesome experience will tell you why. This incident happened three years ago. I had just bought a newly remodeled house. 
As I stood in the hallway of my new home, only two words ran through my mind. It's beautiful. I had been eyeing the house for a while now and immediately got an opportunity to buy it. I did. The house wasn't only beautiful, it had a reasonable price too, as apparently it had been in a terrible fire, one of which I didn't know the details of. But due to that incident, the house's value was reduced, thus making it cheap, which was one of my incentives to get it in the first place. Buying the house and moving into a new neighborhood was the beginning of a fresh start for me and my one-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Foster. Being a single mother wasn't easy, but my little baby girl was the light of my life and I swore to give her the best that I could. The first few months were nothing but perfect. I had completely settled down and I had made a lot of friends around the neighborhood. After the summer, autumn was fast approaching and with it, the Halloween season. Decorations began to go up and I became excited to spend my first Halloween in the new neighborhood. It was on the 31st of October, 2013. The day started out great as people in costumes filled the streets. By the time it was 5.30, I began to hear knocking at the door. I opened up to see the cutest children in costumes and with a big smile, they said, Trick or treat! I gladly obliged and I gave them as much candy as I could. The following hours went the same way as the knocks on the door just kept coming. I didn't complain as the sight warmed my heart and I began to think how adorable my own daughter would be when she's old enough to dress up and go out for her first trick-or-treating. I stayed up giving out candy till it was really late and at around 10 p.m. the knocks on the door had stopped. I realized I was out of candy and I decided to call it a night. So I turned off the lights before going to check on my sleeping daughter in her room. After that, I brushed my teeth and I went to bed. I didn't sleep for long before I was abruptly awoken by loud knocks at the door. I looked at the clock beside my bed and it was 12.01 a.m. Perplexed at who was knocking at this hour, I went down to check. I opened the door to see two children. It was dark so I couldn't make out their faces well. The first child was a boy who I assumed was nine years old and he held the hand of the second child, a five-year-old girl who I assumed was his sister. Before I could say anything, they both said, trick or treat, in unison. I was completely baffled to see children out at this time as it was extremely late, so I blurted out, whoa, it's really late, kids. I'm guessing you guys should go home. I'm all out of candy. I couldn't see their faces well, but I could tell that they were angry at the fact that I didn't have any candy to give them. So they frowned their faces and said, trick or treat. I could notice the anger in their voice as they said that, and I began to get scared, so I said, You kids should really go home. It's not safe out here, and it's no time for pranks. Nothing but silence answered me as the children stood there staring at me with a hint of anger in their eyes. I assumed they were still trying to pull a prank, so I bid them goodnight before closing the door. I began to make my way upstairs, thinking about how odd the recent occurrence was, and before I could reach my room, I began to hear noises coming from the kitchen. Thinking there were burglars, I rushed down to see what was going on. I reached there to see the two children I just saw outside, inside my kitchen, and one of them now held a lighter in their hand. The smell of gas began to fill the room as I looked to the gas cooker and realized it was on full blast. Before I could utter a single word, I heard the sound of the lighter and I watched my house go up in flames. Within seconds, The fire had spread everywhere as I was surrounded by flames. I watched in horror as my home began to burn. I looked forward to see the children, who were now engulfed in flames, begin to laugh. I watched as the fire peeled off their skin and the smell of burning flesh began to fill the room. But to my horror, the children who were still completely unfazed continued to laugh as they were burnt alive. The scene was ghastly and it transfixed me for a while. I began to hear little screams from upstairs and I realized my daughter was still in her room. Lizzie! Before rushing upstairs to her room, before I could reach the door, a huge chunk of burning debris fell from the roof and blocked my path. I tried to maneuver the blockade, but there was no way as the entrance was completely blocked. I tried to get back down the stairs to get some help, but the stairway was blocked too as the flames were everywhere and the ceiling had begun to crumble around me. In that moment, I felt nothing but helplessness, hopelessness, and despair as her screams filled the house. Nothing in this world can be compared to what I was feeling as I heard her die and not being able to do anything about it. 
The pain was unbearable as I was her mother and in some way, I also felt her die. The smoke began to rise and breathing became extremely hard. I began to choke as I fell to the floor. The world around me began to fade away and I was began to give in. I felt arms grab a hold of me and pick me up from the floor. The following seconds were a blur. But before I knew it, I was out of the house and surrounded by firefighters. I began to scream. My daughter is still inside, help her! They began to rush back in, but the house began to collapse on itself and I knew that it was hopeless. As I watched the house crumble with my daughter in it, I felt a piece of me die and I couldn't do anything but cry my heart out. After a while, my grief began to turn into anger as I cursed the children who did it. I decided to call the cops, as with my daughter gone, the only thing I could get now was justice. They escorted me to the police station and I gave them my statement. They looked at me like I was crazy when I explained to them that the children were laughing as they burnt alive. But I stuck to my story as I knew what I saw. The cops checked the house and they said they only found the corpse of my one-year-old daughter and no other bodies were found. Knowing that they escaped made me more angry, so I demanded that they were found and brought to justice. I was then told to describe the children to the police sketch artist. I tried my best to tell them every detail I could remember, as I didn't see the children well. It took about three hours for the sketches to be finished. When it was done, all the cops looked baffled as they saw the final sketch. I was confused as they all began to look at me like I was mad. The elderly cop then asked me, Are you sure these are the children you saw? Angered and frustrated, I screamed back. Yes, it's them. I know what I saw. Now can you please find them and bring them to justice? The cop then looked at me and said, Well, that's impossible, ma'am, because if these are the kids you saw, I can assure you that they couldn't have done it as I knew them very well. I knew something was wrong when he used the word knew, but before I could say anything, he continued with, These kids perfectly match the description of the Johnsons' children, and the Johnsons are the family who formerly lived in the house that you currently reside in. I can assure you that it is completely impossible that these kids were responsible for the fire, as the family had all horrifically died in a similar house fire five years ago. Completely baffled and with nothing to say, I stood up and left the station. While I knew it defied all logic that dead children were responsible for the arson, a part of me believed it as the odd things I saw that night began to make sense to me. After burying my daughter, I left town to move back in with my mother. Most days, I tell myself that it's too bad there's no justice system for the restless spirits that roam the world as there was nothing I could do to find solace. Sometimes, I find myself thinking back to that day and wishing I had given them some candy, as I knew that if I did, they would have left me and my daughter alone. I hope my story is a lesson to all of you, as I urge you to fill your house this October with candy and treats to give, as it's better to give a treat than to experience the gruesome trick.